Section 26 of Cyropedia, The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kane Mercer. Cyropedia, The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon. Translated by H. G. Dakins. Book 6, Chapter 2. About this time, ambassadors came to Cyrus from India with gifts of courtesy and a message from their king, saying, I send you greeting, Cyrus, and I rejoice that you have told me of your needs. I desire to be your friend, and I offer you gifts. And if you have need of anything more, I bid you say the word, and it shall be yours. I have told my men to do whatever you command. Then Cyrus answered, this, then, is my bidding. The rest of you shall stay where you have pitched your tents. You shall guard your treasures and live as you choose. But three of you shall go to the enemy and make believe that you have come to him about an alliance with your king. And thus you shall learn how matters stand, and all they say and all they do. And so bring me word again with speed. And if you serve me well in this, I shall owe you even more than I could owe you for these gifts. There are some spies who are no better than slaves, and have no skill to find anything more than is known already, but there are men of another sort, men of your stamp, who can discover plans that are not yet disclosed. The Indians listened gladly, and for a moment made themselves at home as guests of Cyrus. But the next day they got ready and set off on their journey, promising to find out as much as they could of the enemy's secrets and bring him word again with all possible speed. Meanwhile, Cyrus continued his preparations for the war on a magnificent scale, like one who meant to accomplish no small achievement. Not only did he carry out the resolutions of his allies, but he breathed a spirit of emulation into his own friends and followers, till each strove to outshine his fellows in arms and accoutrements in horsemanship and spearmanship and archery, in endurance of toil and danger. Cyrus would lead them out to the chase and show especial honor to those who distinguished themselves in any way. He would whet the ambition of the officers by praising all who did their best to improve their men and by gratifying them in every way he could. At every sacrifice and festival, he instituted games and contests and all martial exercises, and lavished prizes on the victors, till the whole army was filled with enthusiasm and confidence. By this time Cyrus had almost everything in readiness for the campaign, except the battering machines. The Persian cavalry was made up to its full number of ten thousand men, and the scythe chariots were complete a hundred of his own and a hundred of Aradatas of Susa had provided. Beside these there were a hundred of the old Median chariots which Cyrus had persuaded Cyaxares to remodel in his own type, giving up the Trojan and Lydian style. The camels were ready also, each animal carrying a couple of mounted archers. The bulk of the great army felt almost as though they had already conquered, and the enemy's power was held of no account. While matters were thus, the Indians whom Cyrus had sent out returned with their report. Croetius had been chosen leader and general-in-chief. A resolution had been passed calling on all the allied kings to bring up their entire forces, raise enormous sums for the war, and spend them hiring in mercenaries where they could and making presents where they must. Large numbers of Thracians, armed with the short sword, had already been enrolled, and a body of Egyptians were coming by sea, amounting, so said the Indians, to 120,000 men, armed with long shields reaching to their feet, huge spears, such as they carry to this day, and sabers. Beside these, an army was expected from Cyprus, and there were already on the spot all the Sicilians, the men both from the Phrygians of Lysonia, Paphlagonia, and Cappadocia, the Arabians, the Phoetians, and all the Assyrians under the king of Babylon. Moreover, the Ionians, the Aeolians, and indeed nearly all the Hellenic colonists on the coast were compelled to follow the train of Croetius. 
Croesus himself had already sent to Lacedaemon to propose an alliance with the Spartans. The armament was mustering on the banks of Pactolus, and they were to push forward presently to Thimbrara, the place which is still mustering ground for all the Asiatic subjects of the great king west of Syria, and orders had been issued to open a market there. This report agreed with accounts given by the prisoners, for Cyrus was always at pains to gave men captured from whom he could get some information, and who would also send out spies disguised as runaway slaves. Such were the tidings, and when the army heard the news there was much anxiety and concern, as one may well suppose. The men went about their work with unusual quietness, their faces clouded over, or gathered in knots and clusters everywhere, anxiously asking each other the news and discussing the report. When Cyrus saw that fear was in the camp, he called a meeting of his generals, and indeed of all whose dejection might injure the cause and whose confidence assist it. Moreover, he sent word that any of the attendants or any of the rank and file who wished to hear what he had to say would be allowed to come and listen. When they met, he spoke as follows. My friends and allies, I make no secret of the reason I have called you here. It was because I saw that some of you, when the reports of the enemy reached us, looked like men who were panic-stricken. But I must say, I am astonished that any of you should feel alarm, because the enemy is mustering his forces, and not be reassured by remembering that our own is far larger than it was when we conquered him before, and far better provided under heaven with all we need. I ask how you would have felt, you who are afraid now, if you had been told that a force exactly like our own was marching upon us, if you had heard that men who had conquered us already were coming now, carrying in their hearts the victory they had won, if you knew that those who made short work then of all our bows and javelins were advancing again, and others with them ten thousand times as many? Suppose you heard that the men who had routed our infantry once were coming on now equipped as before, but this time on horseback, scorning arms and javelins, each man armed with one stout spear, ready to charge home? Suppose you heard of chariots, made on a new pattern, not to be kept motionless, standing, as hitherto, with their backs turned to the foe as if for flight? but with the horses shielded by armor, and the drivers sheltered by wooden walls, and protected by breastplates and helmets, and the axles fitted with iron scythes, so that they can charge straight into the ranks of the foe? And suppose you heard that they have camels to ride on, each one of which would scare a hundred horses, and that they would bring up towers from which to help their own friends, and overwhelm us with volleys of darts, so that we cannot fight them on level ground? If this were what you had heard of the enemy, I as you, once again, you who are now so fearful, what would you have done? You who turned pale when I told that Croesus has been chosen commander-in-chief, Croesus who proved himself so much more cowardly than the Syrians, that when they were worsted in battle and fled, instead of helping them, his own allies, he took to his heels himself. We are told, moreover, that the enemy himself does not feel equal to facing you alone. He is hiring others to fight for him better than he could for himself. I can only say, gentlemen, that if any individual considers our position as I describe it alarming or unfavorable, he had better leave us. Let him join our opponents. He will do us far more service there than here. When Cyrus had ended, Chrysanthus, the Persian, stood up and said, Cyrus, you must not wonder if the faces of some were clouded when they heard the news. The cloud was a sign of annoyance, not fear, just as if, he went on, a company were expecting breakfast immediately, and then they were told there was some business that must be got through first. I do not suppose any of them would be particularly pleased. Here we were, 
saying to ourselves that our fortunes were made, and now we are informed that there is still something to be done. And of course our countenances fell, not because we were afraid, but because we would have wished it all over and done with. However, since it now appears that Syria is not to be the only prize, though there is much to be got in Syria, flocks and herds and corn and palm trees yielding fruit, but Lydia as well, Lydia the land of wine and oil and fig trees, Lydia, to whose shores the sea brings more good things than eyes can feast on. I say that once we realize this, we can mope no longer. Our spirits will rise apace, and we shall hasten to lay our hands on the Lydian wealth without delay. So he spoke, and the allies were well pleased at his words and gave him loud applause. Truly, gentlemen, said Cyrus, just as Chrysanthus says, I think we ought to march without delay if only to be beforehand with our foes and reach their magazines before they do themselves. And besides, the quicker we are, the fewer resources we shall find with them. That is how I put the matter. But if anyone sees a safer or an easier way, let him instruct us. But many speakers followed, all urging an immediate march, without one speech in opposition, and so... Cyrus took up the word again and said, My friends and allies, God helping us, our hearts, our bodies, and our weapons have now been long prepared. All that remains is to get together what we need for ourselves and our animals on a march of at least twenty days. I reckon that the journey itself must take more than fifteen, and not a vestige of food shall we find from end to end. It has been made away with, partly by ourselves, partly by our foes, so far as they could. We must collect enough corn, without which one can neither fight nor live. And as for wine, every man must carry just so much as will accustom him to drink water. The greater part of the country will be absolutely devoid of wine, and the largest supply we could take with us would not hold out. But to avoid too sudden a change in the sickness that might follow, this is what we must do. We must begin by taking water with our food. We can do this without any great change in our habits. For everyone who eats porridge has the oatmeal mixed with water. And everyone who eats bread has the wheat soaked in water. And all boiled meat is prepared in water. We shall not miss the wine if we drink a little after a meal is done. Then we must gradually lessen the amount, until we find that, without knowing it, we have become water drinkers. Gradual change enables every creature to go through a complete conversion, and this is taught us by God, who leads us a little by little out of winter until we bear the blazing heat of summer, and out of heat back again into the depths of winter. So should we follow God, and take one step after another until we reach our goal. What you might spend on heavy rugs and coverlets, spend rather on food. Any superfluity here will not be wasted, and you will not sleep less soundly for lack of bedclothes. If you do, I give you leave to blame me. But with clothing, the case is different. A man can hardly have too much of that in sickness or in health. And for seasoning, you should take what is sharp and dry and salted. For such meats are more appetizing and more satisfying. And since we may come into districts as yet unravaged, where we may find growing corn, we ought to take hand mills for grinding. These are the lightest machines for the purpose. Nor must we forget to supply ourselves with medicines. They are small in bulk, and if need arises, invaluable and we ought to have a large supply of straps. I wonder what is not fastened by a strap to man or horse, but straps wear out and get broken, and then things are at a standstill unless there are spare ones to be had. Some of you have learned to shave spears, so that it would be well not to forget a plane, and also to carry a rasp, 
for a man who sharpens a spearhead will sharpen his spirit too he will feel ashamed to wet the edge and be a coward and we must take plenty of timber for chariots and wagons there is bound to be many a breakdown on the road also we shall need the most necessary tools for repairs since smiths and carpenters are not to be found at every turn but there are few who cannot patch up a makeshift for the time then there should be a mattock and a shovel apiece for every wagon and on every beast of burden a bill hook and an axe always useful to the owner and sometimes a boon to all the provisions must be seen to by the officers of the fighting line they must inspect the men under their command and see that nothing is omitted which any man requires the mission of which will be felt by us all those of you who are in command of the baggage train will inspect what i have ordered for the animals and insist upon every man being provided who is not already supplied you gentlemen who are in command of the road makers you have the lists of the soldiers i have disqualified from serving as javelin men bowmen or slingers and you will make the old javelin men march with axes for felling timber the bowmen with mattocks and slingers with shovels they will advance by squads in front of the wagons so that if there is any road making to be done you may set to work at once and in case of need i may know where to get the men i want i mean also to take up corps of smiths carpenters and cobblers men of military age provided with the proper tools to supply any possible need these men will not be in the fighting line but will have a place assigned to them where they can be hired by any one who likes if any huckster wishes to follow the army with his wares he may do so but if caught selling anything during the fifteen days for which provisions have been ordered he will be deprived of all of his goods after the fifteen days are done he may sell what he likes any merchant who offers us a well-stocked market will receive recompense and honor from the allies and myself and if any one needs an advance of money for trading he must send me guarantors who will undertake that he will march with the army and then he can draw on our funds these are the general orders and i will ask any of you who think that anything has been omitted to point it out to me you will now go back to your quarters and make your preparations and while you do so i will offer sacrifice for our journey and when the signs are favorable we will give the signal at that you must present yourselves with everything i have ordered at the appointed place under your own officers and you gentlemen said he turning to the officers when your divisions are all in line you will come to me in a body to receive your final orders End of section 26section 27 of cyropedia the education of cyrus by xenophon this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by kane mercer cyropedia the education of cyrus by xenophon translated by h g dakins book 6 chapter 3 with these instructions the army went to make their preparations while cyrus offered sacrifice as soon as the victims were favorable he set out with his force on the first day they encamped as nearby as possible so that anything left behind could easily be fetched and any omission readily supplied cyaxares stayed in media with a third of the median troops in order to not leave their own country undefended cyrus himself pushed forward with all possible speed keeping his cavalry in the van and constantly sending explorers and scouts ahead to some lookout behind the cavalry came the baggage and on the plains he had long strings of wagons and beasts of burden and the main army behind them so that if any baggage train fell back the officers who caught them up would see that they did not lose their places in the march but where the road was narrower the fighting men marched on either side with the baggage in the middle 
and in case of any block it was the business of the soldiers on the spot to attend to the matter as a rule the different regiments would be marching alongside their own baggage orders having been given that all members on the train should advance by regiments unless absolutely prevented to help matters the brigadier's own body servant led way with an ensign known to his men so that each regiment marched together the men doing their best to keep up with their comrades thus there was no need to search for each other everything was to hand there was greater security and the soldiers could get what they wanted more quickly after some days the scouts ahead thought they could see people in the plain collecting fodder and timber and they made out beasts of burden some grazing and others already laden and as they scanned the distance they felt sure they could distinguish something that was either smoke rising or clouds of dust and from all this they concluded that the enemy's army was not far off whereupon their commander dispatched a messenger with the news to cyrus who sent back word that the scouts should stay where they were on their lookout and tell him if they saw anything more while he ordered a squadron of cavalry to ride forward and intercept if they could some of the men on the plain and discover the actual state of affairs while the detachment carried out this order cyrus halted the rest of his army to make such dispositions as he thought necessary before coming to close quarters his first order was for the troops to take their breakfast after breakfast they were to fall in and wait for the word of command when breakfast was over he sent for all the officers from the cavalry the infantry and the chariot brigade and for all the commanders of the battering engines and the baggage train and they came to him meanwhile the troop of horse had dashed into the plain cut off some of the men and now brought them in captive the prisoners on being questioned by cyrus said they belonged to the camp and had gone out to forage or cut wood so they had passed beyond their own pickets for owing to the size of their army everything was scarce how far is your army from here said cyrus about seven miles said they was there any talk about us down there said he we should think there was they answered it was all over the camp that you were coming ah said cyrus i suppose they were glad to hear we were coming so soon putting this question for his officers to hear the answer that they were not said the prisoners they were anything but glad they were miserable and what are they doing now said cyrus forming their line of battle said they yesterday and the day before they did the same and their commander said cyrus who is he croesus himself said they and with him a greek and also another man a mede who is said to be a deserter from you ah cried cyrus is that so most mighty zeus may i deal with him as i wish then he had the prisoners led away and turned to speak to his officers but at this moment another scout appeared saying that a large force of cavalry was in the plain we think he added that they are trying to get a sight of our army for about thirty of them are riding ahead at good round pace and they seem to be coming straight for our little company perhaps to capture a look out if they can for there are only ten of us there at that cyrus sent off a detachment from his own bodyguard bidding them gallop up to the place unseen by the enemy and stay there motionless wait he said until our own ten must leave the spot and dash out on the thirty as they come up a hill and to prevent any injury from the larger body do you hystapus said he turning to the latter ride out with a thousand horse and let them see you suddenly face to face but remember not to pursue them out of sight come back as soon as you have secured our post and if any of your opponents ride up with their right hands raised welcome them as friends accordingly hystapus went off and got under arms while the bodyguard galloped to the spot but before they reached the scouts some one met them with his squires the man who had been sent out as a spy the guardian of the lady from susa araspas himself when the news reached cyrus he sprang up from his seat went to meet him himself and clasped his hand 
but the others, who of course knew nothing, were utterly dumbfounded, until Cyrus said, Gentlemen, the best of our friends has come back to us. It is high time that all men should know what he has done. It was not through any baseness, or any weakness, or any fear of me that he left us. It was because I sent him to be my messenger, to learn the enemy's doings and bring us word. Araspas, I have not forgotten what I promised you. I will repay you. We will all repay you. For, gentlemen, it is only just that all of you should pay him honor. Good and true I call him who risked himself for all our good, and took upon himself a reproach that was heavy to bear. At that all crowded around Araspas took him by the hand and made him welcome. Then Cyrus spoke again, Enough, my friends, Araspas has news for us, and it is time to hear it. Tell us your tale, Araspas. Keep back nothing of the truth, and do not make out the power of the enemy less than it really is. It is far better that we should find it smaller than we looked for rather than strong beyond our expectations. Well, began Araspas, in order to learn their numbers, I managed to be present at the marshalling of their troops. Then you can tell us, said Cyrus, not only their numbers, but their disposition in the field. That I can, answered Araspas, and also how they propose to fight. Good, said Cyrus. But first let us hear their numbers in brief. Well, he answered, they are drawn up thirty deep, infantry and cavalry alike all except the Egyptians, and they cover about five miles. For I was at great pains, he added, to find out how much ground they occupied. And the Egyptians, Cyrus said, how are they drawn up? I noticed you said all except the Egyptians. The Egyptians, he answered, are drawn up in companies of ten thousand, under their own officers, a hundred deep and a hundred broad. That, they insisted, was their usual formation at home. Croatius, however, was very loth to let them have their own way with this. He wished to outflank you as much as possible. Why? Cyrus asked. What was his object? To encircle you, I imagine, with his wings. He had better take care, said Cyrus, or his circle may find itself in the center. But now you have told us what we most needed to know. And you, gentlemen, he said to the officers, on leaving this meeting, you will look to your weapons and your harness. It often happens that the lack of some little thing makes man or horse or chariot useless. Tomorrow morning early, when I'm offering sacrifice, do you take your breakfast and give your steeds to the provender, so as when the moment comes to strike, you may not be found wanting. And you, Araspas, must hold the right wing in the position it has now, and the rest of you who command a thousand men must do the same with your divisions. It is no time to be changing horses when the race is being run, and you will send word to the brigadiers and captains under you to draw up the phalanx with each company two deep. Now a company consisted of four and twenty men. Then one of the officers, a captain of ten thousand, said, Do you think, Cyrus, that with so shallow a depth we can stand against their tremendous phalanx? But do you suppose, rejoined he, that any phalanx so deep that the rear ranks cannot close with the enemy should do much either for friend or foe? I myself, he added, would rather have this heavy infantry of theirs were drawn up, not a hundred, but ten thousand deep. We should have all the fewer to fight whereas with the depth that I propose, I believe we shall not waste a man. Every part of our army will work with every other. I will post the javelin men behind the cuirassiers and the archers behind them. It would be absurd to place in the van troops who admit they are not made for hand-to-hand -hand fighting, but with the cuirassiers thrown in front of them, they will stand firm enough and harass the enemy over the heads of our own men with their arrows and their darts. And every stroke that falls on the enemy means much relief to our friends. In the very rear of all, I will post our reserve. A house is useless without a foundation, as well as a roof, and our phalanx will be no use unless it has a rear guard and a van, both of them good. You, he added, 
will draw up the ranks to suit these orders, and you who command the targeteers will follow with your companies in the same depth, and you who command the archers will follow the targeteers. Gentlemen of the reserve, you will hold your men in the rear and pass the word down to your own subordinates to watch the men in front, cheer on those who do their duty, threaten him who plays the coward, and if any man shows signs of treachery, see that he dies the death. It is for those in the van to hearten those behind them by word and deed. It is for you, the reserve, to make the cowards dread you more than the foe. You know your work, and you will do it. Euphrates, he added, turning to the officer in command of the artillery, see that the wagons with the towers keep as close to the phalanx as possible. And you, Daouchus, bring the whole of your baggage train under cover of the towers, and make sure your squires punish severely any man who breaks the line. You, Karochas, keep the woman's carriages close behind the baggage train. This long line of followers should give an impression of vast numbers. Allow our own men opportunity for ambuscades, and force the enemy, if he tried to surround us, to widen his circuit, and the wider he makes it, the weaker he will be. That, then, is your business, and you, gentlemen, Arta Ozas and Arta Jersas, each of you take your thousand foot and guard the baggage, and you, Farnochas and Asiadates, neither of you must lead your thousand horse into the fighting line. You must get them under arms by themselves behind the carriages, and you must come to me with the officers as fully equipped as if you were to be the first to fight. You, sir, who command the camel corps, will take your post behind the carriages and look for further orders to Marta Gersas. Officers of the war chariots, you will draw lots among yourselves, and he on whom the lot falls will bring his hundred chariots in front of the fighting line while the other two sentries will support our flanks on the right and left. Such were the dispositions made by Cyrus. But Abradatis, lord of Susa, cried, Cyrus, let me, I pray you, volunteer for the post in the front. And Cyrus, struck with admiration for the man, took him by the hand, and turning to the Persians in command of the other sentries, said, Perhaps, gentlemen, you will allow this? but they answered that it was hard to resign the post of honor, and so they all drew lots, and the lot fell on Aradatis, and his post was face to face with the Egyptians. Then the officers left the council and carried out the orders given, and took their evening meal and posted the pickets and went to rest. End of section 27「Section 28 of Cyropedia, The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kane Mercer – Cyropedia, The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon – Translated by H. G. Dakins – Book 6, Chapter 4 but early on the morrow Cyrus offered sacrifice, and meanwhile the rest of the army took their breakfast, and after the libation they armed themselves, a great and goodly company in bright tunics and splendid breastplates and shining helmets. All the horses had frontlets and chestplates, the chargers had armor on their shoulders, and the chariot horses on their flanks so that the whole army flashed with bronze, and it shone like a flower with scarlet. The eight-horse chariot of Abradatis was a marvel of beauty and richness, and just as he was about to put the linen corslet of his native land, Panthea came, bringing him a golden breastplate and a helmet of gold, and armlets and broad bracelets for his wrists, and a full-flowing purple tunic and a hyacinth-colored helmet plume. All these she had made for him in secret, taking the measure of his armor without his knowledge. And when he saw them, he gazed in wonder and said, Dear wife, and did you destroy your own jewels to make this armor for me? But she said, No, my lord, at least not the richest of them all, for you shall be my loveliest jewel. 
when others see you as I do now. As she spoke, she put the armor on him, but then, though she tried to hide it, the tears rolled down her cheeks. And truly, when Abradatis was arrayed in the new panoply, he, who had been fair enough to look upon before, was now a sight of splendor, noble and beautiful and free, and indeed his nature was. He took the reins from the charioteer and was about to set foot on the car, when Panthea bade the bystanders withdraw, and said to him, My own lord, little need to tell you what you know already. Yet this I say, if any woman loved her husband more than her own soul, I am of her company. Why should I try to speak? Our lives say more than any words of mine. And yet, feeling for you what you know, I swear to you by the love between us that I would rather go down in the grave beside you after a hero's death than live on with you in shame. I have thought you worthy of the highest and believe myself worthy to follow you. And I bear in mind the great gratitude we owe Cyrus, who, when I was his captive, chosen for his spoil, was too high-minded to treat me as a slave or dishonor me as a free woman. He took me and saved me for you, as though I had been his brother's wife. And when Eraspas, my warder, turned from him, I promised, if he would let me send for you, I would bring him a friend in the other's place far nobler and more faithful. And as Panthea spoke, Abradatas listened with rapture to her words, and when she ended, he laid his hand upon her head, and looking up to the heavens, he prayed aloud, O oh, most mighty Zeus, make me worthy to be Panthea's husband, and the friend of Cyrus who showed us honor. Then he opened the driver's seat and mounted the car, and the driver shut the door, and Panthea could not take him in her arms again, so she bent and kissed the chariot box. Then the car rolled forward, and she followed unseen, till Abradatis turned and saw her and cried, Be strong, Panthea, be of good heart, farewell and he thee home. Thereupon her chamberlains and her maidens took her and brought her back to her own carriage, and laid her down, and drew the awning, but no man of all who was there that day, splendid as Abradatus was in his chariot, had eyes to look on him until Panthea had gone. Meanwhile Cyrus had found the victims favorable, and his army was already drawn up in the order he had fixed. He had scouts posted ahead, one behind the other, and he called his officers together for his final words. Gentlemen, my friends and allies, the sacred signs from heaven are as they were the day the gods gave us victory before, and I would call to your minds thoughts to bring you gladness and confidence for the fight. You are far better trained than your enemies. You have lived together and worked together far longer than they. You have won victories together. What they have shared with one another has been defeat and those who have not fought as yet feel they have traitors to the right and left of them, while our recruits know that they enter battle in company with men who help their allies. Those who trust each other will stand firm and fight without flinching, but when confidence has gone no man thinks anything but flight. Forward then, gentlemen, against the foe, Drive our scythe chariots against the defenseless cars. Let our armed cavalry charge their unprotected horse, and charge them home. The mass of their infantry you have met before, and as for the Egyptians, they are armed in much the same way as they are marshaled. They carry shields too big to let them stir or see. They are drawn up a hundred deep, which will prevent all but the merest handful fighting. If they count on forcing us back by their weight, they must first withstand our steel and the charge of our cavalry. And if any of them do hold firm, how can they fight at once against cavalry, infantry, and turrets of artillery? For our men on the towers will be there to help us. They will smite the enemy until he flies instead of fighting. If you think that there is anything wanting, tell me now. God helping us, we will lack nothing. 
And if any man wishes to say anything, let him speak now. If not, go to the altar and pray to the gods to whom we have sacrificed, and then fall in. Let each man say to his own men what I have said to him. Let him show the men he rules that he is fit to rule. Let them see the fearlessness in his face, his bearing, and his words. End of section 28、Section、29 of Cyropedia, the Education of Cyrus by Xenophon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emery. Cyropedia, the Education of Cyrus by Xenophon. Translated by H. G. Dakins. Book 7, Chapter 1. So they prayed to the gods and went to their place. And the squires bought food and drink to Cyrus and his staff as they stood round the sacrifice. And he took his breakfast where he stood, after making the due offering, sharing what he had with all who needed it. And he poured out the libation and prayed, and then drank, and his men with him. Then he supplicated Zeus, the god of his fathers, to be his leader and helper in the fight. And so he mounted his horse and bade those about him follow. All his squires were equipped as he was, with scarlet tunics, breastplates of bronze, and brazen helmets plumed with white short swords, and a lance of cornel wood apiece. Their horses had frontlets, chest plates, and armor for their shoulders, all of bronze, and the shoulder pieces served as leg guards for their riders. In one thing only the arms of Cyrus differed from the rest. Theirs was covered with a golden varnish, and his flashed like a mirror. As he sat on his steed, gazing into the distance where he meant to go, a peal of thunder rang out on the right, and he cried, We will follow thee, O Zeus most high. So he set forth with Chrysanthus on his right at the head of cavalry, and Arsamus on his left with infantry. And the word went down the lines, Eyes on the standard in steady marching. The standard was a golden eagle, with outspread wings, borne aloft on a long spear shaft, and to this day such is the standard of the Persian king. Before they came in full sight of the Assyrians, Cyrus halted the army thrice. And when they had gone about two miles or more, they began to see the enemy advancing. As soon as both armies were in full view of each other, and the Assyrians could see how much they outflanked the Persians on either side, Croesus halted, and ordered prepare an encircling movement, and pushed out a column on the right wing and the left, so that the Persian forces might be attacked on every side at once. Cyrus saw it, but gave no sign of stopping. He led straight on as before. Meanwhile, he noticed that the turning point where the Assyrians had pushed out on either flank was an immense distance from their center, and he said to Chrysantas, Do you see where they have fixed their angle? Yes, I do, answered Chrysantas, and I am surprised at it. It seems to me they are drawing their wings too far away from their center. Just so, said Cyrus, and from ours too. Why are they doing that? asked the other. Clearly, said Cyrus, they are afraid we shall attack. If their wings are in touch with us while their center is still some way off. But, went on Chrysantas, how can they support each other at such a distance? Doubtless, said Cyrus, as soon as their wings are opposite our flanks, they will wheel round, and then advance at once on every side, and so set us fighting everywhere at once. Well, said Chrysantas, do you think the movement wise? Yes, said Cyrus, it is good enough in view of what they can see. But, In view of what they cannot, it is worse for them than if they had advanced in a single column. Do you, he said, turning to Arsimus, advance with your infantry, slowly, taking your pace from me, and do you, Chrysantas, march beside him with your cavalry, step for step. I will make for their angle myself, or I propose to join battle, first riding round the army to see how things are with all our men. When I reach the point, and we are on the verge of action, I will raise the paean, and you must quicken your pace. You will know when we have closed with the enemy. The din will be loud enough. At the same moment, Abradatus will dash out upon them. Such will be his orders. Your duty is to follow, keeping as close to the chariots as possible. Thus we shall fall on the enemy at the height of his confusion. And, God helping me, I shall be with you also, cutting my way through the route by the quickest road I can. So he spoke, and sent the watchword down the lines Zeus our savior, and Zeus our leader, and went forward. As he passed between the chariots and the cuirassiers, he would say to some, My men, the look on your faces rejoices my heart. And to others, You understand, gentlemen, that this battle is not for the victory of a day, 
but for all that we have won ere now and for all our happiness to come and to others my friends we can never reproach the gods again to-day they have put all blessings in our hands let us show ourselves good men and true or else gentlemen can we invite each other to a more glorious feast than this this day all gallant hearts are bidden this day they may feast their friends or again you know i think the prizes in this game the victors pursue and smite and slay and win wealth and fame and freedom and empire the crowds lose them all he who loves his own soul let him fight beside me for i will have no disgrace but if he met soldiers who had fought for him before he only said to you gentlemen what need i say you know the brave man's part in battle and the cravens and when he came to abradatus he halted and abradatus gave the reins to his charioteer and came up to him and others gathered round from the infantry and the chariots and cyrus said god has rewarded you abradatus according to your prayer you and yours you hold the first rank among our friends and you will not forget when the moment for action comes that those who watch you will be persians and those who follow you and they will not let you bear the brunt alone and abradatus answered even so cyrus and with us here methinks all looks well enough but the state of our flanks troubles me the enemy's wings are strong and stretch far he has chariots there and every kind of arm as well while we have nothing else with which to oppose him so that for myself said he if i had not won by lot the post i hold i should feel ashamed to be here in the safest place of all nay answered cyrus if it is well with you have no concern for the rest god willing i mean to relieve our flanks but you yourself i conjure you do not attack until you see the rout of those detachments that you fear so much of boasting did cyrus allow himself on the eve of action though he was the last man to boast at other times when you see them routed he said you may take it that i am there and then make your rush for that is the moment when you will find the enemy weakest and your own men strongest and while there is time abradatus be sure to drive along your front and prepare your men for the charge kindle their courage by your looks lift up their hearts by your hopes breathe the spirit of emulation into them to make them prove themselves the flower of the chariot force be assured if things go well with us all men will say nothing is so profitable as valor accordingly abradatus mounted his chariot and drove along the lines to do as cyrus bade meanwhile cyrus went on to the left where hystaspus was posted with half the persian cavalry and he called to him and said hystaspus here is work to test your pace if we are quick enough in cutting off their heads none of us will be slaughtered first and hystaspus answered with a laugh leave it to us we'll see to the men opposite but set some one to deal with the fellows on our flank it would be a pity for them to be idle and cyrus answered i am going to them myself but remember hystaspus to whichever of us god grants the victory so long as a single foeman is on the field attack we must again and again until the last has yielded with that he passed on and as he came to the flank he went up to the officer in command of the chariots and said to him good i intend to support you myself and when you hear me fall on the wing at that instant do your best to charge straight through your opponents you will be far safer once outside their ranks than if you are caught halfway then he went on to the rear in the carriages where the two detachments were stationed a thousand horse and a thousand foot and told adagerses and Pharnotius, their leaders to keep the men where they were but when he added you see me close with the enemy on our right then set upon those in front of you take them in flank where they are weakest while you advance in line at your full strength their lines as you see are closed by cavalry hurl your camels at these and you may be sure even before the fighting begins they will cut a comic figure thus with all his dispositions made cyrus rode round the head of his right by this time croesus believing that the center where he himself was marching must be nearer the enemy than the distant wings had this signal raised for them to stop their advance halt and wheel round where they were when they were in position opposite the persian force he signalled for them to charge and thus three columns came at once against cyrus one facing his front and one on either flank a tremor ran through the whole army it was completely enclosed like a little brick laid within a large with the forces of the enemy all around it on every side except the rear cavalry and heavy infantry targeteers archers and chariots none the less the instant cyrus gave the word they swung round to confront the foe there was deep silence to the remarks as they realized what they had to face and then cyrus when the moment came began the battle hymn and it thundered through the host 
and as it died away the war cry rang out unto the god of battles and cyrus swooped forward at the head of his cavalry straight for the enemy's flank and closed with them then and there while the infantry behind him followed swift and steady wave on wave sweeping out on either side far outflanking their opponents for they attacked in line and the foe were in column to the great gain of cyrus a short struggle and the ranks broke and fled before him headlong artagersus seeing that cyrus had got to work made his own charge on the left hurling his camels forward as cyrus had advised even at a distance the horses could not face the camels they seemed to go mad with fear and galloped off in terror rearing and falling foul of one another such is the strange effect of camels upon horses so that artagersus his own troops well in hand had easy work with the enemy's bewildered masses at the same moment the war chariots dashed in right and left so that many flying from the chariots were cut down by the troopers and many flying from these were caught by the chariots and now abradatus could wait no longer follow me my friends he shouted and drove straight at the enemy lashing his good steeds forward till their flanks were bloody with the goad and other charioteers racing hard behind him the enemy's chariots fled before them instantly some not even waiting to take up their fighting men but abradatus drove on through them straight into the main body of the egyptians his rush shared by his comrades on either hand and then what has often been shown elsewhere was shown here namely that of all strong formations the strongest is a band of friends his brothers in arms and his messmates charged with him but the others when they saw that the solid ranks of the egyptians stood firm swung round and pursued the flying chariots meanwhile abradatus and his companions could make no further way there was not a gap through the egyptian lines on either hand and they could but charge the single soldiers where they stood overthrow them by the sheer weight of horse and car and crush them and their arms beneath the hoofs and wheels and when the skis caught them men and weapons were cut to shreds in the midst of indescribable confusion the chariots rocking along the weltering mounds abradatus was thrown out and some of his comrades with him there they stood and fought like men and there they were cut down and died the persians pouring in after them dealt slaughter and destruction where abradatus and his men had charged and shaken the ranks but elsewhere the egyptians who were still unscathed and there were many moved steadily on to meet them there followed a desperate struggle with lance and spear and sword and still the egyptians had the advantage because of their numbers and their weapons their spears were immensely stout and long such as they carry to this day and the huge shield not only gave more protection than corslet and buckler but aided the thrust of the fighter slung as it was from the shoulder shield locked into shield they thrust their way forward and the persians could not drive them back with their light bucklers borne on the forearm only step by step they gave ground dealing blow for blow till they came under cover of their own artillery then at last a second shower of blows fell on the egyptians while the reserves would allow no flight of the archers or the javelin men at the sword's point they made them do their duty thick was the slaughter and loud the din of clashing weapons and whirring darts and shouting warriors cheering each other and calling on the gods at this moment cyrus appeared cutting his way through his own opponents to see the persians thrust from their position was misery to him but he knew he could check the enemy's advance most quickly by galloping round to their rear and thither he dashed bidding his troops follow and there they fell upon them and smote them as they were gazing ahead and there they mowed them down the egyptians seeing what had happened cried out that the enemy had taken them in the rear and wheeled round under a storm of blows at this the confusion reached its height cavalry and infantry struggling all together an egyptian fell under cyrus's horse and as the hoof struck him he stabbed the creature in the belly the charger reared at the blow and cyrus was thrown then was seen what it is for a leader to be loved by his men with a terrible cry the men dashed forward conquering thrust with thrust and blow with blow one of his squires leapt down and set cyrus on his own charger and as cyrus sprang on the horse he saw the egyptians worsted everywhere for by now hystaspus was on the ground with his cavalry and chrysantas also still cyrus would not allow them to charge the egyptian phallax the archers and javelin men were to play on them from outside then he made his way along the lines to the artillery and there he mounted one of the towers to take a survey of the field and see if any of the foe still held their ground and kept up the fight but he saw the plain one chaos of flying horses and men and chariots pursuers and pursued conquerors and conquered and nowhere any who stood firm save only the egyptians these and sure straits as they were formed themselves into a circle behind a ring of steel and set down under cover of their enormous shields 
they no longer attempted to act but they suffered and they suffered heavily cyrus in admiration and pity unwilling that men so brave should be done to death drew off his soldiers who were fighting round them and would not let another man lift sword then he sent them a herald asking if they wished to be cut to pieces for the sake of those who had betrayed them or save their lives and keep their reputation for gallantry and they answered is it possible that we can be saved and yet keep our reputation untarnished and cyrus said surely yes for we ourselves have seen that you alone have held your ground and been ready to fight but even so said the egyptians how can we act in honour if we save ourselves by betraying none of those at whose side you fought answered cyrus only surrender your arms to us and become our friends the friends of men who chose to save you when they might have destroyed you and if we become your friends said they how will you treat us as you treat us answered he and the treatment shall be good and what will that good treatment be they asked once more this said cyrus better pay than you have had so long as the war lasts and when peace comes if you choose to stay with me lands and cities and women and servants then they asked him if he would excuse them from one duty service against croesus croesus they said was the only leader who knew them for the rest they were content to agree and so they came to terms and took and gave pledges of good faith thus it came about that their descendants are to this day faithful subjects of the king and cyrus gave them cities some in the interior which are still called the cities of the egyptians beside larissa and Kaline and kaim on the coast still held by their descendants when this matter was arranged darkness had already fallen and cyrus drew off his army and encamped at thimbrara in this engagement the egyptians alone among the enemy won themselves renown and of the troops under cyrus the persian cavalry was held to have done the best so much so that to this day they are still armed in the manner that cyrus devised high praise was also given to the scythe bearing chariots and this engine of war is still employed by the reigning king as for the camels all they did was to scare the horses their riders could take no part in the slaughter and were never touched themselves by the enemy's cavalry for not a horse would come near the camels it was a useful arm certainly but no gallant gentleman would dream of breeding camels for his own use or learning to fight on camelback and so they returned to their old position among the baggage train. End of section 29. Recording by Emery. Section 30 of Cyropedia, The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Emery. Cyropedia, The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon. Translated by H. G. Dakins. Book 7, Chapter 2. Then Cyrus and his men took their evening meal and posted their pickets and went to rest. Bercroesus and his army fled in haste to Sardis, and the other tribes hurried away homewards under cover of night as fast and as far as they could. When day broke, Cyrus marched straight for Sardis and when he came before the citadel he set up his engines as though for the assault and got out his ladders but the following night he sent a scaling party of persians and chaldeans to climb the fortifications at the steepest point the guide was a persian who had served as a slave to one of the garrison in the citadel and who knew a way down to the river by which one could get up as soon as it became clear that the heights had been taken all the lydians without exception fled from the walls and hid wherever they could at daybreak cyrus entered the city and gave orders that not a man was to leave the ranks croesus who had shut himself up inside his palace cried out on cyrus and cyrus left a guard round the building while he himself went to inspect the captured citadel here he found the persians keeping guard in perfect order but the chaldean quarters were deserted for the men had rushed down to pillage the town immediately he summoned their officers and bade them leave his army at once i could never endure he said to have undisciplined fellows seizing the best of everything you know well enough he added all that was in store for you i meant to make all who served with me the envy of their fellows but now he said you cannot be surprised if you encounter someone stronger than yourselves on your way home fear fell on the chaldeans at this and they entreated him to lay aside his anger and vowed they would give back all the booty they had taken he answered that he had no need of it himself but if he added you wish to appease me you will hand it over to those who stayed and guarded the citadel for if my soldiers see that discipline means reward all will be well with us so the chaldeans did as he bade them and the faithful and obedient received all manner of good things 
then cyrus made his troops encamp in the most convenient quarter of the town and told them to stay at their post and take their breakfast there that done he gave orders that croesus should be brought to him and when he came into his presence croesus cried hail cyrus my lord and master fate has given you that title from now henceforward and thus must i salute you all hail to you likewise answered cyrus we are both of us men and tell me now he continued would you be more willing to advise me as a friend i should be more than glad said croesus to do you any good it would mean good for myself i know listen then answered cyrus i see that my soldiers have endured much toil and encountered many dangers and now they are persuaded that they have taken the wealthiest city in all asia after babylon i would not have them cheated of their recompense seeing that if they win nothing by their labor i know not how i can keep them obedient to me for long yet i am unwilling to give them this city over to plunder i believe it would be utterly destroyed and moreover i know full well that in plunder the worst villains win the most to this croesus answered suffer me then to tell what lydians i please that i have won your promise that the city shall not be sacked nor their women and children made away with i promise you in return that my men will bring you willingly everything that is costly and beautiful in sardis if i can announce such terms i am certain there is not one treasure belonging to man or woman that will not be yours to-morrow further on this day year the city will overflow once more with wealth and beauty but if you sack it you will destroy the crafts in its ruin and they we know are the wellspring of all loveliness i'll bet you need not decide at once wait and see what is brought to you send first he added to my own treasuries and let your guards take some of my own men with them to all this cyrus consented and then he said and now o croesus tell me one more thing how did matters go between you and the oracle at delphi it is said that you did much reverence to apollo and obeyed him in all things i could wish it had been so said croesus but truth to say from the beginning i have acted in all things against him how can that be said cyrus explain it to me for your words seem strange indeed because he answered in the first place instead of asking the god for all i wanted i must needs put him to the test to see if he could speak the truth this he added no man of honor could endure let be the godhead those who are doubted cannot love their doubters and yet he stood the test for though the things i did were strange and i was many leagues from delphi he knew them all and so i resolved to consult him about my children at first he would not so much as answer me but i sent him many an offering some of gold and some of silver and i propitiated him as i deemed by countless sacrifices and at last he answered me when i asked him what i must do that sons might be born to me he said they should be born and so they were and that he uttered no lie but they brought me no joy one of them was dumb his whole life long and the noblest perished in the flower of his youth and i crushed by these sorrows sent again to the god and asked him how i could live in happiness for the rest of my days and he answered know thyself o croesus and happiness shall be thine and when i heard the oracle i was comforted i said to myself the god has laid the lightest of tasks upon me and promised me happiness in return some of his neighbors a man may know and others not but every one can know himself so i thought and in truth so long as i was at peace i had no fault to find with my lot after my son's death but when the assyrian persuaded me to march against you i encountered every danger yet i was saved i came to no harm once again therefore i have no charge to bring against the god when i knew myself incapable of warring against you he came to my help and saved mine and me but afterwards intoxicated by my wealth cajoled by those who begged me to be their leader tempted by the gifts they showered on me flattered by all who said that if i would but lead them they would obey me to a man and that i would be the greatest ruler in all the world and that all their kings had met together and chosen me for their champion in the war i undertook the generalship as though i were born to be the monarch of the world for i did not know myself i thought myself able to fight against you you who are sprung from the seed of the gods born of a royal line trained in valor and virtue from your youth while i i believed that the first of my ancestors to reign won his freedom and his crown on the self-same day for this dull ignorance of mine i see i am justly punished but now at last osiris he cried now i know myself and tell me do you think the god will still speak truth do you think that knowing myself i can be happy now i ask you because you of all men have it in your power to answer best happiness is yours to give cyrus answered 
Give me time to deliberate, Croesus. I bear in mind your former happiness, and I pity you. I give you back at once your wife and your daughters, for they tell me you have daughters, and your friends and your attendants. They are yours once more. And yours it is to sit at your own table as you used to live. But battles and wars I must put out of your power. Now by the gods above us, cried Croesus, you need take no further thought about your answer. If you will do for me what you say, I shall live the life that all men called the happiest of lives, and I know that they were right. And who, said Cyrus, who was it that lived that life of happiness? My own wife, said Croesus. She shared all my good things with me, my luxuries, my softest joys, but in the cares on which those joys were based, in war and battle and strife, she had no part or lot. Methinks you will provide for me as I provided for her whom I loved beyond all others in the world, and I must needs send to Apollo again, and send thank offerings. And as Cyrus listened, he marveled at the man's contentedness of soul, and for the future, wherever he went, he took Croesus with him, either because he thought he might be useful, or perhaps because he felt it was safer so. End of section 30 Recording by Emery